In the First World War, the world saw a humanitarian cause that was never seen before. There was an unprecedented combination of national mobilization with brutality. The violence was more effective with the use of technological innovations such as chemical weapons. There were a set of elements that makes the horror produced on the front quite different from the wars that happened before. In addition, there was the advent of photography, and with that there is a strengthening of public opinion, where the public can see the images of the horror of war. It was not just any war, considering the number of deaths and the humanitarian tragedy. It was a war that European society had never experienced before. Within this, there was a need at the time to create a response to what happened. The creation of the League of Nations is relevant for two main reasons. First, because the League talks about how to bring back the type of civilization that existed before the war. Second, the League would try to create an institution with diplomatic arrangements guided by the collective security thesis. This institution aimed at making war illegal, something uncommon at the time. The collective security thesis says that when coordinating the different states, we would make them commit to understanding that aggression against one state would be an aggression against the other members of the League automatically. So if you are an aggressive power, you may think you are strong enough to wage war against another country, but this may not be ideal since you will know that you would have to wage war against another set of countries as well. So what differs the League of Nations from the point of view of the institution and the previous diplomatic arrangements in Europe? It is the idea of collective security. The idea of legally establishing that aggression against one force is an aggression against all other forces. The ambition is that by building and reinforcing this structure legally, a mechanism is created to prevent a new war of the proportions of World War I from being repeated. If the main force takes succeed in submitting to this, it is a resource of high deterrent power. The problem with this whole arrangement is that the scenario between the First World War and the Second did not allow us to reinforce this principle and there was a crisis. So with the Second World War, we see the creation of an even more costly war from a humanitarian perspective. Before the failure of the League of Nations, the first major debate in international relations arises. They are two very antagonistic theories, the classic liberalism and classic realism. Liberalism is based on the idea of the individual's freedom. We need to understand the order's foundations, what makes it different from the West, what caused the order to break, and how to restore it. So how can we govern a society characterized by people who have different interests? Those different interests can be potentially conflicting. Therefore, it is necessary to analyze which is the legitimate instance for the administration of this conflict, and what is the limit of the authority. In the book Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith establishes a fundamental relationship between freedom and prosperity. For Smith, we should not control the actions of individuals and there should be greater freedom for production. The individuals will fail, we organize and adjust the capacities that each one has. These capabilities will allow these individuals to produce as much as they can for the well-being of the community. Thus, the result will be the maximum of collective prosperity. This thesis relates maximum individual freedom to maximum collective prosperity. Liberalism seeks to apply this to international relations. It is the idea that you overcome the dilemma of collective action by creating institutions that preserve the freedom of the individual. There is a philosophical understanding, based on Kant, that the individual has little interest in war as a phenomenon. He does not benefit from the war. When thinking of the ordinary individual, he is not the bureaucrat who benefits from war. For him, war only brings destruction. The war interrupts the transportation lines he needs to transport his groceries for his survival, destroys the plantations, recruits his family to die in a war of an objective that he does not know what it is. War does not intrinsically benefit him. If we look at the individual's reality, he has no interest in war. Those who have an interest in war are the elites who use the state and force it to sacrifice the individual in the name of private interest at the expense of the general interest. It is something that has continued in liberal thought to this day. The state is seen as an instrument captured by private interests and leads society in a direction that is not the general good. At the beginning of the 20th century, European powers were still colonial powers. At the end of the 19th century, there was the height of European colonialism and hostilities between European colonial powers. They benefited from the fact that they entered the Industrial Revolution early, and with their economic power, 
They created banking structures that would finance state structures. This connection between the major industries of the banking system and the debts of the state creates a great power of influence of these private instances on the functioning and politics of the state. These corporations with an interest in the transnationalization of industry activities can use the state so that it moves towards war, so that it can open markets, free slaves and internationalized capital. Thus, war serves the political agenda and economic needs of these groups. It is not necessarily linked to the general interest of society. Furthermore, it is necessary to understand what are the instruments that need to be used to prevent a war like World War I from happening again. Thus, the different liberal authors will converge around three responses. International law, where we see the idea that there should be a legal framework that prohibits war on principle and creates collective security arrangements. International trade, where interdependence is created. It creates an incentive for you to solve your problems with other states peacefully, without leaving you without supplies that are essential for your survival. In this, commercial interdependence generates incentives for the peaceful resolution of disputes and incentives against the increase in aggressive attitudes on the part of states. And public opinion. This aspect is related to the Kantian principle that men are equal and want the same things. The common man, who represents a general will, does not benefit from violence. Thus, the civil society should have vehicles of communication transparent enough for this individual to pressure the state bureaucracy to prevent it from taking an action that is not in its interest. Public opinion says that there must be transparency in the actions of the state. Based on transparency, it will be difficult for the state to override the interests of the individual and to be captured by private interests and to wage war in sacrifice to the interests of society as a whole. That's all. Thanks for watching.